slides. Lovely. So just to introduce myself, my name's um, Bernie Cantrell and I graduated from uh, Sydney Uni in 2014, after which time I moved up to Mount Arthur and worked in a remote outreach role there and then moved to Bundaberg Hospital and have been living in Weeper in far north Queensland since December 2015. So this is a fairly intolerable echo from my end. How about yours? Oh, it's good. Okay, all right. I'll, um, I'll try not to drive myself crazy. <laughs> okay. Um, I work for Torres and Kate Hospital and Health Service. Um, it's far, far north Queensland. You can see on the map Port Douglas here, which is just north of Cairns, which is about here or maybe here. And I live up in this town called Weepa. So um, the hospital and health service covers everything in the green there which is um, Cape York and the Torres Strait. So the demographics of our hospital and health service are that there's approximately 25,000 people, but they're very widely spread across the area. 60% of the population identify as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander. And in many of the remote primary health care centres, we have partnerships with other providers, such as the Royal Flying Doctor Service, um, in a Pima Cape York Health Council, which is a community controlled um, health organisation. And um, also in some communities in the Torres Strait and on the west, I'm sorry, on the eastern side of Cape York, we have Deadly Ears as well, which is a Queensland Health um, Ear Health organisation. So tonight I'm going to be talking mostly about Western Cape Speech Pathology Services, and that is. Here on a bigger pattern, I'm, I seem to be going forward rather than backwards. One moment, please. So, Western Cape Speech Pathology Services cover these communities here down the western side of Cape York. That's these ones here. So, as you can see, it's a bit of a beat to cover. Um, speech Pathology Services in Torres and Cape Hospital and Health Service were funded under a package called the Revitalisation of Rural and Remote Health. Um, we, Torres and Cape, um, employed three speech pathologists um, beginning in December 2015. I have a colleague on Thursday Island who covers um, the 22 primary health care centres in the Torres Strait and Banaga Hospital in what's called the Northern Peninsula area. I have a colleague in Cooktown over on the Eastern Cape who covers Cooktown Hospital and five Eastern Cape communities. And I'm on the Western Cape covering um, Weeper and five outreach communities as well. So this is just about my role a bit. We have a small inpatient facility here at the hospital plus the residential aged care. We run an outpatient weekly oncology clinic which also incorporates tele-chemotherapy um, tele and we, I also see outpatients here at Weeper for early intervention. Any kids who are school aged with um, medical based speech pathology issues and adults as well. Other school aged children, um, Queensland does things a little differently to New South Wales and um, they're funded through Education Queensland. Um, they're able to access speech services. Um, for outreach, there's two communities that can be day trips and those communities I visit once a fortnight. Um, Aratoon is either an overnight trip because it's about two and a half hours drive and it's that's on a dirt road or um, I'm able to sometimes jump on a charter flight with the paediatrician team for a day trip once every two months. The two communities which are further south on the Western Cape I have to fly to Cairns, stay overnight in Cairns and catch a morning flight down to Kawanyama, which I did last week. Work two days in Kawanyama, catch a flight from Kawanyama over to Pontarao on the coast, work there, then fly back to Cairns, overnight in Cairns again before I can fly back to Weeper. So as you can see, there's a lot of 
logistics that um, are needed to make that kind of thing happen. Um, it's it's difficult to buy food in communities at times. There's only a very small store and there's not always access to fruit and vegetables and the like. So um, as well as carrying my clothes for a four-day trip, I've also got to carry food and um, my work kit and laptop as well. So it's a bit of a deal getting there. So this is an example of my outreach kit, which I took down to Kawanyama and Pompera last week. Unfortunately, my previous crate broke, so I got off the plane in Cairns and went straight to Bunnings, picked myself up a Stanley Fat Max, and look, things were good after that. Um, and this is just a couple of gratuitous pretty pictures. So this is an example of the type of charter plane which we might fly on. Um, that was when I was lucky enough to jump in with the dental team going straight down south, which was helpful. And even though they're little planes, you've got some pretty beautiful views that you can see um, when you're flying around the Cape. So this here on the left is a picture of the view going between Kawanyama and Pompera. And Kawanyama is the language word meaning place of many waters. And as you can see, there's lots of rivers there. And on the right is a flight home from Arakin at sunset time. So some pretty beautiful country to see. Okay, so how does telehealth fit into this picture of a new service covering a large geographical area? So when I first started in this role 20 months ago, I gave an in-service, well, it says I'm having video issues, but I'm just going to assume everything's fine until someone tells me otherwise. Yeah, um, so, so yes, yeah, so far so good. Okay, great. Um, so when I first started in this role 20 months ago, I gave an introductory in-service at a nearby primary health care centre. And one of the health workers came up to me afterwards and said, thank you, I really enjoyed your um, presentation because I knew that a pathologist had to do with the blood. So I thought that a speech pathologist was a specialist who took blood from the face. So I said, oh, um, hopefully, hopefully, you know, you've got a bit of a better picture of what a speech pathologist does now. And he said, yeah, yeah, that was very informative. Now, now I know. So I always think about that as my kind of baseline from starting a service 20 months ago. <laughs> People genuinely did not know who a speech pathologist was or what we were able to do in terms of our scope of practice. So it's been a, a been, you know, quite quite a road to come from there to, you know, 20 months in, we now have a pretty well-established speech pathology service. So, you know, um, I, I think it looks like, um, to me, you think, you know, if you build it, they will come. I think it's off my slides. Um, is that right? Yeah, Bernie, your slides have gone down. Okay, well, um, I'll just share again. It's really annoying. Sorry. Um, where are we? Great. Um, Yay. Yes. Terrific. Okay. I'm nothing if not tenacious, guys. <laughs> um, so, look, we have a well-established speech pathology service. Um, I've been doing some preliminary early telehealth sessions with parents and caregivers in communities in between my visits there. Um, there's considerable challenges with staff turnover at primary health care centres and also accessing hard to reach clients. Um, I think that this can be true of people who live in a remote Aboriginal community and people who live in um, affluent suburbs in Sydney. Um, some people have really complicated lives and um, it can be, you know, a challenge to engage parents for whom there are, you know, higher priorities about keeping themselves safe and their kids well and their kids fed and the like. So um, there's a lot of work to be done in this area about paediatric telehealth services. But we do have some other projects going on as well. So um, the telehealth, dis sorry, the telehealth, tele what? The dysphagia telepractice assessment service is a project that we're working on currently um, within Torres and Cape. So at the moment, our service model um, necessitates travel. And there's a clinical risk there that patients 
um, uh, unable to access a follow assessment in WEPA during periods of leave. Um, so I have four weeks annual leave per year. I take two weeks purchase leave because you've got to get out of Dodge. And I bank my RDOs as well. And say there's new periods of sick leave there. So we've got kind of a significant risk around time that I may be on leave, let alone those overnight visits that I mentioned, which take, um, you know, essentially a week away. Um, this year, I'll, I'll leave those references there for you to explore because we're short of time, but there is some robust evidence um, comparing telepractice dysphagia assessment with face-to-face -face assessment and sort of looking at quite some good agreement between face-to-face um, -face clinicians and telepractice clinicians um, uh, for, in terms of the findings from dysphagia assessment. Okay, so the purpose of the telepractice assessment service is to enable um, assessment at a remote location using video conferencing technology and a modified clinical procedure. So it can be inpatient or outpatient, initial or review assessment. So the objectives are to improve access to clinical dysphagia assessment. And um, this is a real need. We've had, um, I'm trying to think, um, you know, well, actually, it's not appropriate for me to give data without having that <laughs> approved, but we've had some clinical incidents um, while I've been on leave with um, management of dysphagic patients here at Weta Hospital. So um, we want to reduce the waiting time for a dysphagia assessment. We want to reduce the length of time that someone may be kept nil by mouth waiting for my return. And we want to improve safety and quality outcomes. Um, help improve the experience of the adult patient with dysphagia, so that would also be reducing the length of time that someone's still by now. Improving our skilled workforce, both um, the clinician doing the telepractice assessment, as well as the health support worker on the other end. And we want to reduce the cost associated with delivery of adult dysphagia services. At present, we um, have a new by mouth procedure for patients at risk of dysphagia, and under this, we um, procedure where you say that if someone isn't able to access a timely dysphagia assessment, we ask the senior medical officer to consider um, transfer of that patient to a facility where they can access speech pathology services. So as you can imagine that um, patient transport, or it's a 12 hour drive from Wethead to Sands Hospital, um, that's not going to be an ambulance drive. Most typically it would be retrieval by the Royal Flying Doctor Service, which can cost up to $20,000 per patient for a retrieval. Pretty expensive. Okay, so we so it looks at our hub and spoke design, where the telepractice speech is at the hub site, providing services to the client at the spoke site. In other hospital and health services, this has been a fixed hub. For example, Cairns Hospital is the hub and the clinician is sitting there at their desk and then the fixed spoke is for example Mossman Gorge Hospital and the patient is there. Um, because we're a bit special we like to do things a bit differently. So our proposed model is essentially for me as the telepractice clinician to be a travelling hub. So say for example I'm right down in the south of the um, Cape and the patient presents at Weaver Hospital and a few patient who needs um, who needs to be seen, then I can go to the video conference room in Kawanyama and the health support worker here in Weta will be able to bring the patient to the dedicated area to to be able to perform the assessment. So um, for us the research coming out of Royal Brisbane Hospital with Claire Burns and team actually based this model on a speechy and an allied health assistant. We don't have any allied health assistants in Torres and Case, but we're looking to train up our outpatient clinical nurse as well as our advanced health worker to um, be the support worker. Okay, this here goes through the um, eligibility for telepractice dysphagia assessment. So we need someone to be um, medically stable and to be clinically appropriate to participate in the following assessment. We need to be able to position them adequately in front of the camera. 
there need to be alert enough to participate in the following assessment as per any other behaviour assessment. They need to have an appropriate level of attention and concentration. They need to be able to communicate adequately to participate in the following assessment with support in the same way that we would face to face. And we need them to be able to hear and see adequately to participate in the assessment. So I can think of some patients for whom automatically this won't be an appropriate model. Patients with advanced dementia, patients who aren't able to um, sit up in a chair or, you know, who would need to be in a bed and supported in a bed to be sitting up. So there's some, consider there's some considerations around eligibility. Okay, so in order to roll this model out, we're here. We've got some really terrific stakeholder engagement. Our senior medical officers, our medical superintendent here at the hospital, and our nurse unit manager, who would really like me to stop filing clinical incident reports, are all on board and would like a telehealth dysphagia assessment. Um, the service approval is from our team leader here, manager of community services, and our um, governance model is a little more complicated um, in that there's only the three speech pathologists across the health service who are all um, at the same level. But we have clinical supervision with the advanced speech pathologist from the from Cairns Hospital and we're also getting support from um, a clinician at Cairns Hospital who has done this role out herself as well. Um, service funding and reimbursement is unfortunately a bit of a miserable feast. Um, there's certain, you know, look, the stars have to align, you have to turn left and um, be wearing the next pair of jocks in order to get the reimbursement for a particular telehealth um, session. However, there are, you know, we're, we're working with our telehealth team around how this can also be a source of revenue for the hospital here. Our administrative processes will um, sort of work around how we're capturing the occasions of service and the data um, in our system and our communi communication processes, how do we make sure that our locums and our principal house officers who come up here for short rotations as part of their rural generalist training are also aware of the service and are also aware of the possibility of assessment when I'm on, um, on outreach or aware of the possibility of accessing assessment from my Cooktown or Thursday Island colleague when I'm on leave as well. And also maintaining our, sorry, resources and equipment. Pretty easy, BTC equipment we already have, lapel mics we need to purchase, um, you know, a chair with arms uh, to make sure we've got the, um, the right room with appropriate lighting to be able to see um, the patient's face, etc. Staff training is really looking at the, the regularity of these referrals to make sure that we um, are able to sort of do this often enough to keep up the skill, like the, maintain the skill set essentially. So there's also a fair bit of service documentation we need to put together to um, have this service established um, and um, the work unit guidelines there, a referral form, the booking form, um, a pro forma for the assessment and how we write that up. And actually under Queensland Health, um, the Royal Brisbane team has put together a really fantastic um, online learning package which has um, some templates for all of this documentation as well, which we can adapt to be site specific for our individual hospitals. Bernie, given that time is short, oh, you're already moving on. Perhaps we can switch. Yes. We can skip the ENT slides. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Because the, the yep. stuff you just did was the important stuff. Okay. No worries. Mm. So ENT is about improving access to services. They're doing some store and forward there to enable to try to cut down um, the waiting time for ENT. So essentially, store and forward. Check if the Quality of the information is adequate for review, and then the ENT is able to review and write um, recommendations, whether that's for surgery or community management or for the telehealth consults, etc. Um, teleaudiology is also pretty good because it's all in all in the pipeline, but at the 
moment it can be quite a gap between accessing audiology services and actually getting hearing aids fitted. Um, so this year would hope to be um, Australian hearing on the other end of the line essentially and the Apuna Pima audiologist here um, on the ground and to be able to do that fitting sort of immediately rather than waiting months at a time. So, in summary, speech pathology services in Cape York are young and developing. We've got exciting projects underway. The ENT project has made some great gains in providing access to audiology. And we've got some future opportunities, of course, which is looking for um, external providers who have gone through the Queensland Health Credentialing process um, to be able to provide telehealth via VTC in Queensland Health Clinic because in many of the communities I work with, um, many patients don't have a phone number, let alone a home internet connection. So at times we're looking at using the Indigenous Knowledge Centre facilities in the schools, but the schools have some reservations around providing um, like genius sites for um, telehealth there or patients attending the clinic and using the video conferencing facilities or a movie facility there as well. So, um, you know, thinking about NDIS rollout and private telehealth providers, these are opportunities um, for the future. Um, any questions, you're welcome to email me um, or, or ask anything else that might be difficult. And there's another pretty picture coming from Primaripin. So, thanks thank for your time. You. <laughs> thank you, Bernie. You're welcome. Actually, that went surprisingly well, given how many technological w problems we've had. I'm going to hang up on you um, very shortly. Um, so, thank you to Bernie. We have a number of other presentations. Bernie, if you drop out because you can't hear, we will fully understand. Thank you. Bye.